Before we get into the absolute beatdown that was episode 12, I noticed that a few of you wanted to hear more about Aiz's thoughts on Wine's actions. Well, there was a clear distinction made in the novels that went to explain why Aiz acted the way that she did. One that if not explicitly mentioned, could make her sudden change of heart seem rather shallow. So, what Aiz had noticed about Wine was that she wasn't trying to explain herself or prove that she was innocent. She was acting the way she did, fully expecting this to be her last moment. She was well aware that it was only a matter of time before Aiz's sword would strike her down and it'll all be over. So, before that could happen, Wine was letting out all the emotions from the depths of her heart, knowing that this would be the only and last time that she'd ever get to say them. It was a heartfelt final wish that brought emotion and reason back to Aiz's mindset, and with it came all sorts of internal contradictions that she didn't know how to handle. This was why Aiz changed her mind. Not because she was giving Wine a chance to live, but instead because Wine had been able to express emotion in a way that most others aren't even able to. With that done, there were now two groups of Xenos trying to get to the dungeon. The one that was with Bells and the other that had met up with Asterius. Since Fels' group had already made it into the tunnels, it was no longer possible for the other group to meet up with them. So, Bell had to think of another way to get them to the dungeon. Lucky for him, he remembered a place where there could possibly be a hidden entrance. One that was supposed to be shown in Season 2 along with the Orphanage. If you don't remember, there was a time when Bell had stumbled into a secret tunnel behind the church that led into these massive ruins. It was a place where he had unknowingly fought a Xenos that escaped from Dix. Because this monster had seemingly appeared out of nowhere, it made Bell believe that this underground passage had to lead to one of the doors of Gnosis. And sure enough, what they found was exactly that. So, with the operation now complete, there was a cutscene after that showed Finn's reaction to the aftermath. The fatal flaw in his planning was the underestimation of the strength of the Hestia Familia. That was the one oversight that led to his downfall. It also didn't help that he didn't properly position his troops either. You see, there was one very important thing confusing Finn this entire time, and that was the fact that the Xenos were heading towards the 21st district of Daedalus, an area he was certain didn't have an entrance to Gnosis. It was actually for this reason that he didn't station anyone to guard it. So, Finn was confused as to why the Xenos were heading there. If their goal really was to get back to the dungeon, then their movements didn't really make any sense at all. It was a train of thought that made his thumb ache as if something was wrong. Which brings us now to the reveal of Hermes' deception. As we know, the notebook he'd been passing off as the original was a complete forgery. The real one had never even left Dix's hands. So, this was something that Hestia only realized when the text on the pages didn't bleed. The pages themselves didn't even start to deteriorate. For a notebook that's supposed to be over a thousand years old, it didn't make sense for it to be this durable. The magic from back then just wasn't advanced enough. So, Hestia immediately knew that this notebook was nothing more than a fake. As for how Hermes made it, well, he had ordered his familia to survey Daedalus in its entirety, including the whole first layer of Gnosis. This is the main reason why Asphi had been looking so tired. She'd been tasked with replicating the layout of Gnosis so that Hermes could pass off this notebook as the original. Of course, everything beyond the first layer was fake, and various parts of the true layout had been modified in order to lead the Xenos into these traps. Once those changes were finished, Hermes then had Asphi use her magic to create the illusion that the book was old. He then used Adanos as a means to get Hestia to trust that the book was real. Had the notebook come directly from him, then it was likely that there'd be at least a little doubt regarding its validity. But because it came from someone like Odanos, everyone trusted it without a single hesitation. So, while everyone else was being fooled by the plans of this god, it turns out that the only person who actually read the situation correctly was Finn. Now, when Hestia went to meet up with Bell, she updated his status so he could be at peak strength for whatever came next. This was because she was about to send him back into the tunnels to find the Xenos, a situation that would likely put him up against the Loki Familia again. But right as she finished, that's when Gnos and the others started to attack the surface. Out of all the reactions we saw, the one that wasn't included was Shakti's. Remember, Ganesha had previously told her about the existence of the Xenos, so she couldn't believe what she was seeing when they started to attack the plaza. These supposedly intelligent creatures that she previously felt sorry for were now looking no different than the monsters from the dungeon. It was a sight that made her unsure as to whether she should fight or not. So, in the end, the only order she gave was to protect the townspeople. 
Now, Finn, who was watching from a distance, wasn't sure as to what to make of this. He was, however, certain that the Xenos' inexplicable behavior was the result of a third party's intervention. As he thought about what that mysterious party's goal could be, he suddenly remembered the words that Loki had told him from earlier that night. It led him to make the decision to take his own group of people and go directly to the plaza himself, leaving Raoul and Reveria in charge of the others. By the time Finn arrived with his unit, Bell was already mid-battle with Gross. He was putting on a show that all the bystanders couldn't help but get behind. So, the previous state of panic was now slowly turning into support for Bell. Because this was such a peculiar situation, Finn decided not to get involved yet. He did order his unit to keep the other monsters in check, but he wasn't going to interfere with what Bell was doing. That said, he also wasn't going to let the Xenos fly away either. So, numerous archers readied themselves in response to Finn's command. As the fight continued, we already know this whole situation was in order to get Bell to make a choice. A choice where the only right answer was the one to save Aina. It was the single path laid out to him by the god that was forcing its will onto him. But rather than choose to kill Gloss or let Aina die, Bell instead chose to believe. It was the third unthinkable option that set him free from Hermes' plans. And not only did this work to get Gloss to stop, but it also got Finn to halt his familia's attacks. You see, if Gloss had gone any further than he did, then all of the Loki familia's archers were ready to shoot him. But because Gloss had backed off like he did, Finn was the first to react by giving the orders to wait. He was shocked by the very strange sight that he had just witnessed, and that shock seemed to resonate to the crowd below him. It didn't take long for that shock to shift to suspicion though. If it wasn't clear before, it was now very apparent that Bell had some deep connection to these monsters. So many people in the crowd began to shout at him. The whole situation became exceedingly chaotic as no one was sure what to make of it. That said, this wasn't exactly something that Hermes didn't account for. In the case that something like this did actually happen, Aspi was ordered to use the magic item known as Kritzia, a needle-shaped weapon she personally designed with the purpose of sending monsters into a frenzy. Although it carried the risk of making them stronger, its primary function was to get monsters to attack each other. That's what made them useful on expeditions. So you can only imagine what kind of damage Gloss would do had he been hit by one of these needles. But as Asfi was about to send them flying, there was a brief moment where she had quickly glanced at Bell. Although it was only for an instant, it had gone to make Bell aware of her presence, and this had prepared him to move before she could even do anything. In the instant that both were about to act, Finn's thumb began to ache stronger than it ever had before, alarming him to the massive monster that was quickly approaching. Now, we already know that Otar was the one who led Asterius to Bell. But the anime didn't explain why Asterius didn't fight Otar. Well, that was because Asterius knew that he would lose. Even if he had both his arms and all his power, he still felt that this warrior was far too strong for him. Without a doubt in his mind, Asterius knew that this person would kill him. Even so, Asterius was still grateful to have come across such a powerful opponent. It wasn't exactly the dream that he'd been looking for, but to say that he was unhappy about it wasn't correct either. You see, another one of Asterius' wishes was to die to someone as strong as Otar. So, now that this person had finally appeared, there wasn't really any point in turning away from it. Instead, Asterius accepted whatever fate awaited him, which just so happened to be the one that brought him to Bell. So, this brings us now to the climax of the entire season. As soon as Asterius made his battle cry, pretty much every first tier adventurer in Orario reacted almost instantly. Eyes, Tiona, Tione, and Bait all ran towards the sound of it. The Loki Familia's archers began shooting, and even Finn was able to throw his spear. But nothing stopped Asterius from his charge towards Bell. The arrows had no effect, and Finn's spear did nothing more than grace his skin. As we saw, it took no more than a few seconds for Hermes' entire theater to be reduced to rubble. The plaza had now returned back into its initial state of chaos. Except, this time it wasn't by the design of any god. This time it was due to an unpredictable element that neither Finn nor Hermes could have anticipated. To Finn, the existence of this Minotaur was a true and genuine irregular. A threat he knew he had to take down right here and now. But right when his unit was about to jump in, that's when a certain few people stepped in to stop him. Now, Asterius' initial confrontation with Bell gave us a bit more of his backstory. 
he wasn't like the other Xenos who were reborn from their desire to reach the surface. No, what brought him back to life was his desire to reach Bell. His unyielding determination to have this rematch. Those feelings to see the opponent of his dreams were so strong that it pushed him to be reborn again. Even his name is out of reverence for Bell. Asterius, which is said to mean lightning, serves as this symbolic expression for the crimson light he always sees at the end of his dream. Anyway, because Asterius was covered with wounds and on the verge of death, Bell couldn't help but respect his will to fight him. Something about the way he was expressing his deepest desire just seemed to resonate with him. It reminded him of how he was when they had first fought together. So he felt it wouldn't have been right for him to run away. Now, the ensuing fight was very clearly a battle of speed versus strength. Just the wind coming off Asterius' weapon was capable of doing damage. I mean, numerous bystanders could be seen getting blown away by its backdraft. So it wasn't enough to simply dodge. Bell had to completely avoid the direction the weapon was coming from. He started out by using his swift footwork to remain on Asterius' weaker side. Knowing how strong this monster was, Bell felt that if he wanted to win, he needed to take advantage of every weakness that he could. So that included aiming for where Asterius had no arm. As the two continued to fight, the Loki Familia could only stand by and watch. Finn had given them the orders not to get involved under any circumstance. But just because he had given that order, didn't mean that they were happy with it. Most of them couldn't take the disgrace of just standing there and watching. I mean, this was a very crucial fight being left to a boy that they'd been criticizing for the past few days. So, rather than stand by and do nothing, they instead surrounded their target and prepared themselves to attack from all directions. The moment they were about to strike, Asterius used his howl to incapacitate every single one of them. The level 2 rearguards found themselves on their knees, and the level 3 frontline were completely stiff with fear. This was essentially Asterius making a statement. A proclamation that anyone other than Bell wasn't worthy to fight him. In order to make that perfectly clear, Asterius removed the adventurers surrounding him with a single swing of his fist. The people watching could only stare in wonder as the little rookie was the only one not immobilized by terror. The howl was something Bell was all too familiar with. It wasn't something that would cause him to waver anymore. But what Bell needed to win was more than just a little confidence. Even keeping himself in Asterius' blind spot wasn't enough to overcome this monster's superior skill and tactics. It was just too obvious what Bell was aiming for. So Asterius countered with a massive kick exactly like how we saw in the anime. When they returned to the plaza, numerous adventurers decided they needed to take action. Despite knowing it was a futile effort, the sight of all the crying townsfolk made them desperate to try anything. They just wanted to bring an end to the chaos. It was a feeling of desperation that eventually turned into a sense of duty. A duty that compelled them to protect the women and children. So many adventurers cast aside their own terror and charged towards Asterius. But Asterius showed neither care nor remorse for any person who interfered. He simply charged straight through the adventurers standing in his way. It was a relentless stampede that brought destruction to all in equal measure. The strongest adventurers didn't even last more than a couple of seconds. All that remained behind Asterius' ravaged path were bloodied bodies and broken weapons. After seeing so many adventurers get sent flying, no one else was able to muster up any courage to step up next. Even when Asterius turned his gaze towards the kids from the orphanage, not a single person was able to move an inch to try and save them. Bell was the only one who rushed to their aid, leaving an impression of heroism that Lai and the others could only marvel at. Who the kids had previously thought to be this traitor, now showed the image of a man with boundless courage, a lone man who wasn't afraid to throw himself into an adventure. It was something that them and all the others could only classify as a true adventurer. The sight was so inspiring that Lai now found himself in tears as he struggled to make out the words he'd always wanted to say. But before he could, that's when Mort stepped in to do just that. He began to cheer for Bell, which in turn spurred everyone else to do the same. They were so encapsulated by Bell's pure desire for victory that they couldn't even think about calling him a traitor anymore. All they wanted now was for Bell to win. As the fight made its way towards the central park in front of the dungeon, it continued much like how we saw in the anime. Almost every person we know was now watching from a distance, giving their own bit of input as to what exactly they were seeing. No matter how much everyone wanted Bell to win, it didn't change the fact that Bell was slowly losing. 
I mean, had Asterius not already been on the verge of death, then Mel knew that he wouldn't have lasted even a single minute. But that still didn't stop him from wanting to win. What Bell saw behind Asterius was all the people who went to show him just how powerless he really was. It brought forth this feeling of inadequacy that further increased his desire to become a hero. More than anything, Bell just wanted to prove himself by beating this opponent. So with this new ambition now fueling his strength, Bell pushed himself beyond his limits in a direct attack that caught Asterius completely off guard. He had led a charge with his sword then switched to attack with his body kicking the Minotaur in the chin then following it up with a direct punch to the face. The instant his fist made contact, Bell then let off six consecutive firebolts, crushing one of Asterius' eyes in the process. This was the move that gave Bell the opportunity to land those consecutive sword strikes. Now, the final moments of this battle were about as accurate as you can make it. They really did put a lot of effort into showing Bell get his ass kicked, so not much really needs to be said about that. At the end though, Bell's frustration with himself had led him to come to a crucial realization, one that connected everything he needed in order to grow stronger. What he realized was that Asterius had now given him a second reason to grow. He gave him something else to aim for other than eyes. Yes, this was an excruciating defeat, but it also brought forth a new ambition with new goals to strive towards. That was what Bell had learned. As he continued to cry over his loss, Aina had actually made her way all the way down to him. She knelt by his side and held the hand of this adventurer who looked so very unfamiliar to her. It was a part of Belle that she'd never seen before. Not because it was a boy who was crying, but instead because what she was seeing was the bitter tears of a man. It was a sight that made her realize that something was now growing in her heart. It was a sweet yet painful feeling that she couldn't turn away from. So that brings us to the end of this episode. The ending credits do cover most of the epilogue but it does miss out on the wrap-up between Uranus and Hermes. They pretty much went back to cooperating as if things were normal. Both had their reasons for acting the way they did, and both understood the other's reason for doing so. So, in the end, it was pretty much just business for both of them. When Bells returned to talk to Uranus, he couldn't completely reject the way that Hermes had acted. This was because he too was willing to choose the same path that Hermes did. A path where he would decide to bet everything on Bell. Now, the only thing left to mention is the very last part with Eyes. After Bell had said that he wanted to become stronger, Eyes simply acknowledged his statement then began to walk away. It was as she did that for the first time Bell wasn't watching her back. Instead, he was looking far into the distance towards the single tower that touched the heavens. This was the location where his new promises and final battle awaited. So this was where he needed to focus his attention now. It was a scene that went to highlight Bell's progression as a character. His goals are no longer these shallow things like reaching eyes or becoming the hero. Instead, they now have actual purpose. It's a mindset that you can't really refer to as a single-minded pursuit anymore. So that brings us to the end of Season 3, and with it comes the end of the Danmachi content. If you were only here for the Danmachi stuff, then I really do appreciate you supporting the series. I mean, I hope you'll be able to stick around for the ReZero and Mushoku Tensei stuff. But if not, then I guess I'll see you around whenever Season 4 comes out. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!